Hello, my name is Noah Ravoy, and I'm back with Haythrun for another interesting interview. She came to me with a fantastic topic to discuss, the effects of father investment on the development of masculinity and femininity. And we're going to talk a lot about what happens when that father investment is lacking or it is inappropriate in some way, it is not sufficient for a healthy development of the masculine and feminine. Welcome. And oh, thank thanks so much for having me back, Noah. It's, it's great to talk with you again. Yeah, this, what you sent me in an email is absolutely fantastic, and it really matches with what I've seen in my clients. And I think it was so important that, that we get this out to people so that they can understand what's going on in their own lives and have some sort of model to understand how perhaps they can move towards, towards a healthier situation and they can resolve some of their, uh, their childhood trauma to the, the best possible. Now, we certainly don't have all the answers. And if you ask us to point to you to the study where it proves scientifically that this happened, um, that's not going to be possible. But, you know, both of us have a lot of experience with people. And everything that you've written here really matches with my experience and with your experience dealing with various people. And, you know, a lot of this is things you actually lived. And I think it's important. Um, every, every study is a whole bunch of single individuals and collecting their data. So, you know, what, what you specifically went through, modeling that out can very much be, be powerful to helping other people. Perhaps you can explain some of the, the basics of the ideas that we're going to talk about tonight. Sure. Um, before I do that, let me just uh, give the folks a little bit of a background as to how I came to this in the first place. Um, this dovetails a little bit on the previous video that we did um, where we, talk, we were talking about Generation X. I'm a Generation Xer. My peers are Generation Xers for the most part. And uh, we, we were one of the most challenged generations because of there, there was such a, a lack of father investment. The, the divorce rate among our parents as a generation was the highest uh, of any divorce rate before or since uh, we started recording these things. So um, I got a lot of source material on uh, the effects of fatherlessness just from my own experience and the experience of my peers. And uh, I was also always a, a student of philosophy. I enjoyed reading philosophy in my youth. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a saying over the, uh, the Oracle of Delphi that says, man, know thyself. That's, that's the very first thing you got to do. You, you've got to know yourself. And, uh, you know, before you can have agency, you have to help, have self-knowledge. And if you don't have self-knowledge, well, you can't get any further than that. And in addition to that, Aristotle uh, told us that um, the virtue that virtue lay in the mean between two extremes. So this kind of formed the beginning of how I started to interpret what I saw around me and trying to put that into some kind of um, model that would be useful for me and useful for others. And one of the things that I saw was that uh, there was a correlation between dysfunction, like emotional dysfunction, and specifically personality disorder, and fatherlessness. And, and to the extent that somebody had insufficient father investment, uh, that seemed to correlate directly to the degree of their dysfunction and the degree to which their personality was disordered. And I saw this again and again and again uh, in people. And I also saw it in myself because I grew up without uh, sufficient father investment as well. So that was kind of the starting point, you know, was, um, was sort of making that observation. And the people who were fathered, the people who did come from an environment where there was sufficient father investment or maybe even a very high degree of it, they had extremely ordered personalities. They were very high functioning. And so I saw a correlation there too. So basically to sum it up is, um, you know, we all come out of chaos. We, we begin in a, in a chaotic state. We're psychotic when we're born. And we have to be socialized in order to participate in society in a way that's going to serve us and serve others. I mean, that, that's the basics of it. And the father is the ordering influence. So without that, we remain in a psychotic state. It's as simple as that. And uh, if you're a, a psychotic person, uh, and you're trying to, to get along in the world, try to get along in society, you're going to have a very difficult time, you know, to the extent to which y you are psychotic. And a lot of times, you know, people 
put a lot of emphasis on IQ and that is an important measure because it says, you know, maybe how far you can go, but you can be absolutely brilliant and you can be emotionally broken and be still be low functioning. Or you can be really high functioning in one area, but maybe you're, you're not good at relationships. You're not good at um, emotional things because you've, you've uh, not had that part of your training from the father. You've not had that organization. You've made up in some other area. And so you, we see this with a lot of uh, artists, high, high functioning artists. And you'll see they have terrible, sad lives. Uh, you know, I, I think Jim Carrey's a little bit like that. You can you can tell there's a lot of sadness there. Mm -hmm. You can tell in um, uh, there, there's quite a few different. Um, I, without getting into specifically, uh, I think Prince had a lot of that too. And there was there's quite a few artists that you would see uh, amazing at what they're doing, but they couldn't hold a relationship. They couldn't um, they couldn't manage their personal life, and they ended up with a lot of drug and alcohol abuse, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I, I think some of that is just part of the artist's plight in general. I mean, I'm a creative person, so I can speak to this. Uh, when you live in the abstract world, <laughs> you know, because that's, that's where your gifts are, you, you have a gift for being able to touch the abstract, to touch the chaos and, and, um, and understand it and wrap your head around it and grasp it. it. It can be very challenging to have to deal with the very ordered world of society and civilization. I mean, just, just by virtue of being an artist, just because that's, what your genes bequeathed you. Hmm. But if that's further compromised by the fact that you didn't have good father investment, sufficient father investment, you don't even have a language. I mean, you're, you're just living in that chaos all the time. And I mean, it can be very, um, it, it can be very, I'm trying to think of the right word for it. It's, I mean, it's, it's exciting and it's adventurous and uh, it's almost like a drug that you can just constantly imbibe and get high off of. But it's not useful to you. If you can't do anything with it, it you know, it, it, it can be, uh, it, it can be very painful to live that way. You know, if you can't make any oh, yeah. use of your gift. So I, I think the fathering influence allows a highly creative person to sort of unlock that, that box of treasure that they have and do something useful with it. And something I'm going to point out too, is that, uh, a lot of the people in the dysfunctional people that we're going to be speaking about, um, they do tend to hurt people around them. And so what happens is when I talk about dysfunction, the people who have been hurt by these people, they're, they're in so much pain that they don't want to talk about solutions. They just want to talk about isolating and escaping these kind of people. There is a point where, where sometimes that is necessary, but it's very important that during this conversations, um, the listener has some empathy with the people that are going through this, this lack of father investment who are suffering as well. And it doesn't mean that you need to put yourself in a vulnerable position around these kind of people. You, of course, you have to protect yourself, but you, you also need to have some, some human compassion and understanding for what these people have gone through. And uh, this is, I think it's going to become more clear as we describe the details of it. Yeah, that's very important because, um, you know, none of these people chose to be what they are. They, they didn't choose the circumstances that formed them. And I think many of them are just doing the best that they know how to survive. And um, so we have to keep that in mind. You know, yeah, I've, that, I've had a lot of uh, people, clients, some and, and some other people write to me and say, you know, you talk about what is uh, ideal behavior or uh, what is an ideal situation? And I find that very difficult because my childhood was so traumatic that I can never measure up to the ideal. And, you know, this makes me feel like I'm worthless and I have a lot of compassion for these people. And I, I don't, it's not me condemning them when I talk about uh, ideals. It's a goal to shoot for. And to a large extent, I'm trying to influence people to parent their children better so that though their children have those ideals or they can reach as close as possible to those ideals. Whereas, um, you know, those who have already gone through terrible traumas or, or simply the trauma of a lack of any investment, they, they, I, I have empathy for that. And, you know, those are the people that I'm often helping to order and sort out their life. I'm, I'm providing some of that um, structure to them in, in the capacity that I can. And I think it's, uh, it's, under, it's good to understand, too, that it's not just 
men or just women that suffer from that lack of parental investment. It's both men and women. And so I think the conversation today is going to be very beneficial for both groups. Yes, I agree. Um, and, and what you're doing essentially is providing a compass or a roadmap to somebody who's lost in the wilderness. You know, they're, they're just kind of stumbling about in the chaos of the wilderness and, and somebody like you comes in and you provide them with some tools to help them navigate their way out of that. And that's yeah, important. Absolutely. And a lot of what I do is encourage people to navigate towards a place where they can get daily help and so as opposed to, you know, once a week, once a, every other week or once a month help. Um, right. It's impossible for a, a mentor can't save you. Uh, no. you, need, you need a much more intimate relationship in order to, to get out of this situation. So you, you uh, wrote that there are two types of currencies, a masculine currency and a feminine currency. Perhaps you could ex explain that concept to us. Yes. Yes. I, I like to talk about, these in terms of the masculine and the feminine as opposed to men and women because both men and women have both the masculine and the feminine in them they just have them in varying percentages okay so I, I like to refer to them in this way so that we understand that this is something that both men and women possess but it's it's um masculinity and femininity or these masculine and feminine currencies are what men and women use to barter for what they need from the opposite sex in the marketplace. So the masculine form of currency uh, is what I identify as vigor and vigor would be mental and physical strength, energy, and health. Okay. And I liken that to a fire. So if you can visualize vigor being a fire, and, and having these qualities, that would be the masculine form of currency. The feminine form of currency I call value, and um, that is mental and physical receptivity, chastity, or the ability to, to contain, to hold something, and also health. And that can be likened to a vessel or a cup. So if you can imagine that as being something that investment would be put into, um, and it would receive that, and it would hold that, and it would be healthy enough to, to do both of those things. So... Men typically are bartering their vigor uh, in exchange for a woman's value and vice versa. And I, I say typically because, of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. There are always some women who are far more masculine than they are feminine and some men who are far more feminine than they are masculine. But on the aggregate, in general, this is most people. Most men are going to be bartering their vigor. Most women are going to be bartering their value if that makes sense. Yeah, it's unlike any currency, its value will depend on the market. You know, if you're in an unstable situation, um, you know, our ancestors were in essentially a constant state of war, then the masculine currency was much more valuable uh, under that situation. And when you have a time of peace, it becomes a little bit less valuable, uh, or at least it changes in how it's, it's spent. And same with the feminine currency. Um, you know, if we're, we're heading into a time where men can access women online for free through pornography and it has degraded the feminine currency the the value that women are able to to give to men so both men and women's currencies have been devalued in in the last you know 30 years yes unfortunately that's true um but um well, I, I think there's more to it than that. Like for the example you just gave of, um, you know, men getting sexual access to women through pornography, that's sexual access, but they're not getting a return on their investment, mm -hmm. just like they don't get a return on their investment when they compete in a video game versus competing in the real world. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a simulation. It's an illusion. They're pouring their energy into something that isn't going to give them any kind of return. Mm -hmm. Now that's an important um, that's an important distinction, and then, yeah, that 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 informs now that what you just said shifted my entire view of the the conversation in a good way. Um, yeah, it's it's important the the investment of the currency that you have and getting a return on it. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah. And, and women do the same thing in reverse. I mean, and we're going to get into this as we start to talk about these archetypes that I observe and, and how they correlate with personality disorder. But, um, you know, a woman who is not uh, spending her value where she's going to get a return on it, she's engaging in the same kind of um, behavior that doesn't serve her. If, if she has poor boundaries and uh, she makes herself emotionally and sexually available to men who do not invest in her, 
she's engaging in the same kind of wasteful uh, behavior that, that a guy does who's um, burning up his vigor, playing video games and, and watching pornography. Mm, that's an excellent point. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people will say, oh, there's, there's nothing wrong with these things. They're perfectly fine. Um, but it, it is a, as you mentioned, it's, it's a waste of your energies. Right, right. So, yeah, you, you want to spend your currency where you're going to get the, the best return, the highest return on it. I mean, that's economics. That just makes sense. Now, another interesting thing that you point, that you point out here, a lot of people think that uh, masculinity is on a 0 to 100 curve, for example. It's like a bell, a bell curve, 0 to 100. Mm -hmm. um, and you point out that there's actually a negative 100 to a plus 100 curve for masculinity and femininity. Could you explain a little bit more how that would work? Sure, sure. Um, this is the way that I've observed it is, um, again, let's take, let's start with masculinity, masculinity first. And let's take a look at that um, visual that I gave you of a fire. Okay. Um, ideally, you want a fire that's going to be useful, right? It's going to provide light that you can see by, it's going to provide heat that's going to warm you, and it's going to provide energy uh, that, you, that you can expend um, to, to produce some kind of, of useful output, right? That, that's what a useful fire is. So a man whose vigor is sufficient and properly uh, channeled, that's what he's going to be doing with this fire. Now, at the far end of the spectrum, let's use like a minus 100 to a plus 100 just to keep this simple so people can understand. At the far end of that, on the left, the minus 100, that would be a fire that is so insufficient. It's like a dimly lit candle, if you can, if you mm -hmm. can visualize this. It, it, it produces so little light, heat, and energy that is, it is of no use. Okay, it can't produce any output that's going to that's gonna either serve itself or serve anybody else. At the other end of the spectrum, the plus 100 side of this, imagine a wildfire that's burning out of control. It's so intense and it's so unbridled that it just destroys everything in its wake. And again, it's not useful either. Okay, so a man wants his vigor to be useful. And that lies in the mean. That lies at zero between minus 100 plus 100, if, if people can visualize that in their minds. Yeah, we'll put up some graphics along with this uh, audio as well, so make it easier for people to understand. You know, sure. it's, it's very interesting, that, that concept, because um, we'll talk about deficiencies in masculinity. And um, I often get the, the, the thing that the, the alpha, the ideal man, is a, a violent psychopath um, who is, is dangerous to, you know, da dangerous isn't a problem. It's the out of control dangerous. The exactly. Dangerous. It's a chaotic yes. dangerous that right. is a problem. And th there's lots of masculinity there, but it's out of control and therefore it's useless. Um, right. In fact, it's worse than useless. The guys who are the flickering candle, they're mostly hurting themselves. The men right. who are the wildfire, they're hurting themselves and everyone around them. Um, well, I, I could make an argument that um, both of them are harming others as well as themselves. And that's because um, the dimly lit candle, because he cannot be of service to himself, because he doesn't produce enough fire uh, to, to even be self-sufficient, he's dependent. Therefore, he's parasitic. Mm -hmm. So he is harming others. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've actually seen um, cases. I've had clients come to me and their father was essentially that candle. He, yeah. he was a very weak man. And the mother um, came in and, and essentially she was the man in the relationship because he wouldn't step up. She had to. And they, the client, you know, the, the male clients, they found it very hard to express their masculinity because they felt that if they became a better, more ideal man, it would emasculate their father. And it was hard for them to understand he was already emasculated. And right. They, they weren't going to change that by their behavior. But it's, uh, it's difficult for a man to say, I'm going to be more than my father was. And sure. So they have such a bad example. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for them to, to come back to that mean again. They don't even know where it is. Sure. But, but if they want to serve their, uh, their ancestors, I mean, if, if they're a person who, who values their genetic history and their genetic legacy, um, they, they need to change their view. They have to have a paradigm shift and, and look at it not in terms of, well, I'm, 
I'm somehow disrespecting my father if I become a better man than he was. No, you should want to be a better man than mm -hmm. he was. You, if, if you want to carry that, you know, into the future, that should be your wish for yourself. And that should be your father's wish for you too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I say all the time that I'm trying to raise my three sons to be better men than I am. Uh, you know, it's right. We, we have a debt. It's, it's not even do we want to make our ancestors proud. We have a debt we owe them. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we want to pay that debt, we owe it to them. And, you know, our, our father isn't our ancestors. Our father is one individual. We right. have far, 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 far more ancestors than just one. And, you know, we, we have that debt to them. They did, they suffered so that we could exist. And we have a debt to pay back to them by being the best man and woman or woman that we can be. Yeah. And the other thing that people have to keep in mind, um, you know, nature is pretty simple. <laughs> um, nature abhors a vacuum and everything has to add up to 100%. So if you're taking, uh, taking a look at a marriage where you've got a, a, a father who's the dimly lit candle, um, of course, the woman, the, the wife is going to have to compensate for that. And, and, and you will see this happen all the time in relationships where you've got, um, you've got a male who's, who's insufficient in his masculinity. What happens is his partner will become more masculine. She'll take on a more masculine role to compensate for that because everything's got to add up to 100, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, it's, it's the, the number one advice I give to clients who come to me and say, I wish my partner was more masculine or feminine or whatever. I say, well, the way you can change that is by you being more what you should be, they will re react to that. It, exactly, exactly. And, and we're going to talk about that later, about um, how men and women influence, influence each other. That's another observation I've made. But I, I'd like to dig in um, to masculinity and femininity and, and how, like we were saying, it's on a spectrum. We talked about the, um, the masculine spectrum. I'd like to talk about the feminine spectrum as well. Um, with femininity, um, again, it is, uh, it's like a vessel or a cup, right? And um, what we see at the extremes here is um, it's basically a sense of self-worth, okay? A woman learns what her value is by what is reflected from her father. Okay, a father, uh, this is very important, a father reflects for his daughter what her value is. And this teaches her not only what she's worth, like what her market value is, but also what she should be looking for in a man so that she knows how to negotiate her value for the best deal she can get. And she learns all of this from her father. So if there was insufficient father investment at the minus 100 end of the spectrum, she's going to underestimate her value. That this is the girl who has a poor sense of self-worth. Maybe she feels worthless and maybe she engages in self-harming behaviors. Maybe she cuts herself. Maybe she burns herself. Um, maybe she's got unhealthy eating habits. Um, maybe she scars herself, tattoos herself, what have you. Th these are all expressions of self-loathing. And this comes from a sense of worthlessness that she has learned from the absence of the father reflecting what her true value is. At the other end of the spectrum, the plus 100, this is the girl who overestimates her value. She, she thinks she's all that in a bag of chips. She's perfect. She has no flaws. I think we all know the type. Okay. Yeah, I think you and, call them the princess. Call the, her the yeah. princess. Yeah. Yeah, there's four archetypes that um that I've identified that correlate with the extremes of both spectrums. Okay. Yeah, you have the the, the uh for the men it's the antisocial, the the negative one hundred, it's the parasite. The mm -hmm. plus one hundred is the predator, the the narcissistic violent predator. And right. for women, it's the, the negative is the pariah or persona non grata, the, the, the shrew that nobody wants. And right. then the other end is the borderline princess, um, the, the, you said histrionic here. So the, yeah, the, 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 think she's the center of the universe. Yeah, the, the borderline, um, we're, we're getting into some cluster B personality disorder um, 
words here if, if, if people aren't familiar with that. There's, um, there's four different types of personality disorder that fall under the cluster Bs. Uh, it's the antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. The first two, um, antisocial and narcissist, uh, those tend to be very masculine in their expression. And when we see personality disorder in men, it, it generally does express itself through one or both of those two uh, cluster B types. Uh, the, uh, the feminine counterparts to that are the borderline and the histrionic. So again, when we see the personality disorder expressed in women, it generally expresses itself through one or both of those. And, and oftentimes you will see comorbidity. Mm. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if a guy is um, very narcissistic, he's also oftentimes um, a sociopath as well. He doesn't have any empathy. For anybody. Um, he's preying on people. He's happy to steal from you or to sponge, sponge off of this other person. There's, there's no empathy there for his fellow man. And um, with, with women, oftentimes, um, you know, she may be a drama queen and she, she thinks that she's all that and she's very vain and, um, you know, believes that she's perfect. But deep down inside, she really has a sense of worthlessness and you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, she may be binging and purging in the bathroom. She may be cutting herself, uh, you know, and then covering that up, you know, with makeup or what have you to appear perfect to everybody else. So oftentimes there is comorbidity that's going yeah. on there. It reminds me of the uh, stepmother from Snow White, uh, who was a, a narcissist about, you know, she was the most beautiful woman in the land but she was constantly asking the mirror to make sure she was still the most beautiful woman in the land. Cause the reality is, is she also had a very low self esteem. Exactly. And that she wasn't the most beautiful. It was, it completely crushed her uh, rather than her having other virtues that she could rely on as well. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it is often, you will get a mixture of these things and very often because it's chaos, it's instability. You will see a fluctuation between various things depending on how they are at the moment they can go from excessive ridiculous amounts of self-confidence to no self-confidence within seconds yes yes and um you know i just have to say that in in my experience um the the mental health profession you know the psychologists and the psychotherapists and uh, licensed counselors they are really uninformed on this and and i don't know why that is um but uh Making the connection between personality disorder and a lack of father investment or insufficient father investment, I think is so critical to being able to provide effective intervention for people who are afflicted with this. And I do not know why um, there's, 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 there's such a lack of information among the, the professionals in, the, in this area. I, I think they really I'm, need to start I looking at the, I'm not sure that the professional's primary objective is efficient treatment of the problem. Uh, I think it is, uh, to a certain extent, it's, it's an industry. And if you can prescribe someone a pill instead of actually solving the problem, you have a constant stream of income. If you can get people to come into your office every week and talk to you for an hour and pay you $250, $300, uh, you have a constant stream of income. On the other hand, if you can help direct them into a situation where they can start to resolve their own issues, uh, you're constantly undermining your own ability to have clients. And that's what I do. Um, you know, my clients don't stay clients forever. They end up improving and moving on. And that's, that's my goal as a coach, but I'm not part of the mental health care profession. So I have a different goal. That, that's a fair point, and I agree with you. You're, you're spot on. It's, it's, it's the same thing we see in uh, you know, the, the physical health profession, the medical profession, mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah. And, I, and I don't even blame the individual professionals for that. The entire industry is so tightly regulated that they more or less have to follow what they're told to do. Um, there, are, there are therapists and psychologists that have better ways of treating people and they can lose their license sometimes for giving advice that is factual, effective, but doesn't meet the guidelines that they've been given by the governing bodies that govern their professions. So it is very difficult for people in these professions and they can shut up, be quiet and make lots of money, 
or they can really try to help people and constantly be under threat for their, you know, losing their license. So it's, it's difficult, especially if they have a family to support. I do understand sure. some of that. Well, you, you used a word there that I think is key. You used the word treat. And um, that's the same thing that medical doctors do. They're, they're treating the symptoms of a disease or an illness or, or a disorder as opposed to providing intervention and administering nutrition, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, in the form of food for a physical ailment. Or in this case, it's this investment we're talking about. It's essentially love, okay, mm -hmm. um, providing that nourishing love that's going to heal the person who's going to, it's going to make them whole again. I mean, we actually get the word heal from the Anglo-Saxon hull, which means wholeness, wholeness mm -hmm. and health are the same thing. Yeah. To make you complete again. Exactly. exactly. And I think this is part, this is something that, um, uh, there, when I'm, when I'm dealing with a client, I'm always looking for where they're incomplete and I will ask a series of questions to figure out where their life is incomplete, where they are, where on the, for example, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where is it incomplete? What are they not able to provide for themselves? And that starts to indicate to me at what level their childhood trauma was and how, how deep it is that we need to go in order to solve uh, the actual problem rather than just treat the symptoms. Right. And, and I think this could be another helpful tool for you to find out where they are on the spectrum. How far from zero are they? And in which mm -hmm. direction, or possibly both? How disordered is the personality? Um, you know, if you consider what we're discussing here, I'm going to give you another visual model so so folks can maybe wrap their heads around this. If you take a look at a storm system, uh, you know, like a hurricane that's forming over over the ocean, it's very loose and chaotic at the outer bands, right? But in the center, where the the heat from the the temperature of the water and the air are, are churning, and that's what's creating that organized system. It's very, very structured in the center, very structured, more chaotic towards the outer bands, okay? Same thing here. Where that father investment is, is ordering the, the, the chaos, the, the, the feminine, and, and those two are working in concert, you're gonna see a very organized system that's well-structured. When that's absent, it's all over the place. And, and that's why somebody who has a disordered personality may express it through one or more of these archetypes. And uh, I, I can tell you as somebody who's, uh, who's got, I, I would argue probably a close to 50-50 mix of masculine and, and, and feminine in myself, um, it can express itself through all four. If, if somebody is kind of a 50-50 masculine feminine versus say, like a man who's very masculine, he's got maybe, you know, 90% masculine traits, 10% feminine traits, it may express itself, you know, only on the masculine spectrum. You could have somebody with all four personality disorders expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So for somebody like you, who's working with people who are coming from these less than ideal childhoods, and they're trying to sort themselves out and put themselves together, to, together and become useful to themselves and others, it's really important to understand, first of all, what's the mix of masculine and feminine in this person? I would love for somebody like a Jordan Peterson to develop a test for people so that they could identify, you know, what's my mix? What's, what's my balance of masculine and feminine? So one, I know myself, and two, I know what I should be looking for in a partner. And, and then, you know, be able to look at this spectrum and say, okay, how ordered is my personality versus disordered and in what ways? And I generally find the more masculine a man is, the more feminine his partner needs to be, the closer yes. he is to the center, uh, the, the more alike they will be. And it's, it is, like you said, things in nature want to be balanced. And if you have uh, a woman who's 50-50 and a man who's almost all masculine, there is going to be an imbalance there and neither will be happy. Uh, it's not it's not just a matter of are is an individual a good marriage mate it's are they a good marriage mate for you yes and, and that is uh that is a much more complex question because you have the interaction between the two people and all of us are a split and right we're a split and we're all different levels of off from zero very few people probably are completely on zero right yeah um i don't think 
there's probably anybody who's a perfect zero, and I don't think there's probably anybody who is a, a perfect negative 100 or a positive 100. Um, Julius Evola speaks to this in, um, what's the name of the book? Eros, the, uh, the Mysteries of Love, the Metaphysics of Sex. Great book, by the way, for anybody who's interested in uh, Evola's philosophy. And he refers to the absolute man and the absolute woman in this book. And this is where I first um, encountered this idea that men and women are this mix of masculine and feminine. You know, none of us are, are a 100%. Neither are any of us a zero. We all have this mix. And what you're going to be looking for in your counterpart is as you say, whoever complements that mix in you. You know, so if you're a 40-60, you're going to want somebody who's a 60-40 or, or as close to that as you can get. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and, I, and I think the, the, at the moment, you kind of have to do, you have to measure yourself in a very subjective way. And it would be good if there was a test, an objective test. And anyone who's listening to this that has a um, you know, background in research and especially in psycho psychological research, contact me. And, you know, I, I would love to work with you to help develop a test like this. I think it would be very useful to help a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it would be more useful than, uh, than what we see in the dating apps. I mean, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, for, for people who are looking for partners, you know, who, who really are looking for a, a partner that they can pair with, that would be an invaluable tool. Yeah, I think a lot of times people, they meet someone, they go, oh, we had chemistry. And it's just because they're not able to articulate what was actually happening. And I think a lot of times what's happening is they're meeting someone that's the right distance away from zero to match up with them and make a balance. Right, right. Where, where would you like to go from here? I mean, did, did I cover the archetypes yeah. sufficiently? Or okay. I, I think so. I think we're, we're, we should go over the part where you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned that it, you, you're going to see a, with lack of, father investment you're going to see it fit in or uh, have an effect on the personality on the body so you'll you'll notice the appearance uh, mm -hmm. this is this is why i have you know why i will talk to men about looking for what looking at what the woman looks like and vice versa i'll talk to women and say pay attention to what the man looks like because we signal our inner person through the way we choose to to look and we choose yeah, it, a way to signal that yeah, the, um, the type and the health of the personality expresses itself through the type and the health of the body, that I find. There, there's definitely it's, a correlation. It's interesting that the, in Western culture, there has become a uh, – we used to have a real culture of beauty. Western culture was a culture of appreciation for aesthetics. We can see that in Greek and Greco-Roman statues. We can see that in the artwork of Northern Europeans as well. And it used to be that Northern Europeans had very complicated artistic work, and then it became more simple over time. And then with the rise of Christianity, uh, there became almost an embarrassment about beauty. Uh, beauty was put as, as uh, you know, it's vanity, it's unimportant, aesthetics don't matter. And the reality is, is that aesthetics do matter. Um, this doesn't mean we're all going to be beautiful. But we do have to recognize that we are signaling something by the choices we make. And that yes. signal is, is being picked up by everyone. And everyone recognizes that even if we try not to judge it, it is, it is part of who we are as human beings. Yes. And, you know, even if we weren't born with great genetics, um, we can do a lot. I believe, to increase our sexual market value by making healthy choices, you know, in terms of fitness and diet and, and how we choose to appear to others. There, there's a lot that can be done there to improve how we aesthetically appear. And, and vice versa, if we had excellent genetics, but we are, um, you know, making a lot of bad decisions, it's not going to help. It's, you know, it's a, it's a quadrant where there's, there's four, four uh, squares in the quadrant, and one of them is great genetics, and we took care of ourselves. And then on the, the worst section is we had bad genetics and didn't take care of ourselves, and then we have somewhere in between on the other two. But it is definitely, we need both in order to really see the full expression of ourselves. Yes, and, and I think part of what probably contributed to that culture of appreciation for beauty that you mentioned that we had in antiquity uh, when we had more of a pagan society 
is the fact that one, we had much more father investment in mm -hmm. those days, right? But we also lived in much closer connection to the natural world. And so there was, I think, probably more of a balance between um, civilization and this appreciation for the compromises we have to make for civilization, but also eugenics. Mm -hmm. um, pe people just made better marriage choices. You know, they, they chose to, to mate high. And, and so we had more beautiful people who were raised well and took care of that beauty and passed that on to the next generation and celebrated that in their art. And if we look, for example, in, in Greco-Roman art, the gods were always depicted. God, the gods of any society are the goal of what you want to attain. You want to be like the gods uh, as right. much as you can as a human. The gods were always depicted as being beautiful. And the, the titans, for example, were often depicted as more ugly because they were the, they were the bad guys. They were unattractive. And in, when Christianity came along, very often you will see, and this is not actually from the Bible, but it is, is common in um, Christian depictions of Christ that he is emaciated and very unattractive, uh, really, really a, almost a horror show up on a cross. And so the ideal goal of what people wanted to be was shifted through this, you know, basically they were memed into thinking that ugly was beautiful and beautiful was ugly. And uh, this is a... Uh, I think we're, we're still have not recovered from that in Western culture back to the point of appreciating aesthetics again. And we see that with modern architecture and perhaps we are even getting worse when you see modern architecture intentionally making the landscape more ugly rather than beautifying and improving it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a topic for another day, but mm -hmm. I, I, I personally um, believe and I observe that there's been a deliberate corrupting influence that, mm -hmm. um, that, that's responsible for that. We used to celebrate excellence. You know, ec excellence comes from the root word er or ar, and we see this in the Greek, we see it in the Norse, we see it in the Celtic. Um, that root ar, it, it means excellence, where we get aristocracy from, it's where we get aristos, you know, in Greek from. That's what it refers to, high, noble, excellent. And we used to celebrate that, we aspired to that, that was a virtue that we had as Europeans and we've lost that and we need to get back to that and to bring us back to what we were talking about. That's the role of the father, the mm -hmm. father, the, the fathering influence. I mean, he not only orders the chaos, but he's the one who's responsible for cultivating virtue in, in his children and his dependents. And, and, cultivating that virtue in them and that vision for them to understand uh, what they should be chasing. Uh, when when you, we talk about ideals and ideals trigger people so much, it's an indication of how poorly they were parented, how little fatherhood investment that they have in them, that they not only can't reach an ideal, they don't even want to try to reach an ideal. They don't even want to try to to be the best that they can be because they don't believe they have the value uh, or, or they're, they're on the other side. They're so narcissistic that they think they're already perfect. You know, right. I'm, I'm going to be talking at an event that's uh, make women great again. And the common response I get back is women are already great again. You know, we, we've been doing the, the people are doing that. have been doing a convention for 15 years about making men better. Nobody said, Oh, men are already perfect. I, that we never heard that once the whole time. And uh, it's because it, men, to a certain extent, know we need to improve. And this is, as you mentioned, to some extent, men can fix their lack of masculinity by finding masculine role models. It's very difficult for women. So this is something I, I think we should talk about next. Is, so what do people do with this information? Aside from the, what we mentioned, looking for a mate that is your a healthy balance to your masculine and femininity. What else do we do with this? How do we, how do we repair and heal a lack of masculine fatherly investment in us as children, uh, especially for boys? We'll start. Okay. With okay. Well, well, first of all, um, let, let's first understand that what what do men and women do for one another? How do they influence one another? I think that's important. Yes. Um, and there's two words that I like to use here, uh, very specific inspire and impress okay women influence men by inspiring them 
men influence women by impressing them. Okay, now let's break that down. Now, the word inspire has the word spire in it. Okay, and a spire is, is basically a, a conical shape that tapers upwards. Okay, so what women do is they influence men to achieve great heights, essentially, to, to, to accomplish and achieve. They inspire them upwards. Mm. Okay, men impress women in two ways. One, they they evoke or or they can evoke if they are um, impressive enough a response in them that uh, that evokes on the part of the woman admiration and respect for the man. Okay, they literally impress in that way. The other way they impress is if you can imagine putting your hand in wet clay. They they put their mark on a woman. They, they mark her and claim her in some way. And, and this is something I, I really do want to speak to before we get into um, uh, the influence of fathers on boys uh, versus girls. Um, because I think a lot of guys might be confused or maybe uninformed about what it means to dominate a woman. I, mm -hmm. I, hear, I hear the word dominance used a lot <laughs> in men's circles, and, and I don't think they understand what that means. And as a woman, I'd like to give them some feedback. Um, you don't dominate a woman by using force or violence or, or in some way conquering her in, in that way. You do it through this impression that I'm talking about by evoking this admiration and respect from her and by leaving your mark on her first, first on her mind. And then if you succeed there, you can progress to her heart. And then if you succeed there, finally her body. Okay. And th this is how you dominate a woman is by impressing her. If you sufficiently impress the woman, trust me, she'll be yours. That, that's how it works, okay? So I, I wanted to just put that out there so that folks understand how men influence women, how women influence men. This is what happens in the sexual marketplace. This is also what happens between parents and their children. Okay, the mother inspires the son and the father impresses the daughter. Do you see this? Yes, yes, yes. And I, I think that, that that definition of or that explanation of dominance is very important for men and women to understand. Um, the reason why dominance has a bad reputation is very often from men who are, they're incapable of impressing women. And so they try to use force and we'll see entire cultures where that is de facto how it's done. And that is not that is not the way to uh, to impress. To, that is not the way to dominate women. That is viable in the long term. If you force women uh, into a situation, they will find ways to make your life hell. And if they can't make your life hell, they'll make your children's life hell. And we see that in every culture that abuses women, that they end up taking it out on the children. And it yes. is not a sustainable way to have a culture. There's, there's three words I'm going to throw out at you. This, this is how women essentially get revenge on men who do not, uh, do not treat them with respect and, um, and, and love. Abuse, abort, abandon. That's what they do to their children. That's, mm -hmm. how, that's how a woman punishes a man for not treating her with respect and honor. Abuse, abort, abandon. Think about and, that, guys. And, okay. and, we, and we will see in modern culture that that is extremely common. And people will say, well, women aren't being abused in Western culture, but goes back to the fatherhood investment. A lack of investment is abuse. Yes. A lack of investment in your daughters is abuse. And, you know, there are, there are lots of cases where the father can't because he's been pushed out of the family through family courts and whatnot. But whatever the reason is, that lack of fatherhood investment is abuse, which then ends up, you know, we, we can't ignore what's happening in culture. There is a reason this is happening. Well, uh, e even a man who's been forced out by the courts, he, he doesn't have any contact with his children because he's been forced uh, to the outside. He can still model and encourage masculine um, be a masculine role model for his children by being a man, even if he's in prison. Even mm -hmm. if they put him in prison, he can still model that by just being a man. And at least his children will, will have that. Well, and, and, you know, the damage that's caused by them not getting that investment when they're young, when, they, when they're older, 
you know, there is a, you know, there's 16, I think you get to choose who you want to be with. Um, then it can, they can start to heal that. And there's a lot of healing that can be done. You know, a lot of damage can be done. A lot of healing can be done as well. Um, but very often people, who are in this situation, there is a lack of masculinity to begin with. And then you add on top of that, the court systems and other things. And much of what's going on is intergenerational. It is, yes. it is not, it didn't start with your generation or my generation. It started a while back and it's just getting worse and, and happened to take a big leap I don't know, backwards, I guess you'd say, not forward with Gen X. And, um, you know, the, the modern, the, the latest generations are looking at this and trying to figure out how to fix it. Um, right. And, and the youngest ones, they still have an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to salvage their potential. Mm -hmm. My generation, unfortunately, uh, there was no information that was really available that was going to be of use to us until most of us were well into our 40s. So for both men and women, Gen Xers, I mean, our potential was stolen from us. Mm -hmm. we, we basically didn't get a shot <laughs> at anything. Um, we're trying to build our lives now with what we've got left. But what we can give to the younger generations is this wisdom that we've gleaned. You know, the things that I'm sharing with your audience right now, this is my value. You know, I, I don't have the value that I had in my youth because that was literally stolen from me. But I have this instead. So this, this is what I barter. Um, in exchange for the things that I need. So that's something to keep in mind, folks, you know, when you're dealing with people, um, you know, appreciate where they're coming from and, and what they're offering you um, based on their experience. You had asked about um, the, uh, I think the consequences for, for boys versus girls. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, for, for boys, um, as I think I mentioned earlier on, or maybe you mentioned it, um, a, a boy who did not get sufficient father investment, he can still um, attain that masculinity, cultivate that masculinity because it's latent in him. And they have that Y chromosome that girls don't. Um, so that latent masculinity can, can be awakened and encouraged uh, through mentoring. He can get that through uh, working with somebody like yourself, like, like a life coach, or, um, you know, an uncle or an older brother or, um, you know, some other... Uh, join, join a sports team, uh, an all-man sports team. Uh, you know, sure. just go to the gym. Go to a good, you know, jiu-jitsu gym, for example. And go yeah. with the men there, you know. Yeah, any, any kind of, of brotherhood um, where the, the men are, are active in masculine uh, pursuits and and you would have that camaraderie a, a boy's going to find that there but even if he can't find that as, as I said before I think Stefan Molyneux uh, talked about how he basically groomed himself on the classics just reading the great thinkers the great male thinkers of western civilization and just uh, just absorbing that work enough uh, that might be enough to get a, a boy started so boys have a lot of options as far as getting that uh, father investment and that mentoring girls on the other hand based on what we just talked about right the the impressing of girls um, if they don't get the investment from a father their second chance at that is getting it from a husband but here's the catch-22 and um, I, this is where I understand the, the plight of men. Men don't want to invest in women that are damaged. And I understand why, because who wants a broken cup, right? You pour water into a broken cup, what's going to happen? It's going to spill out all over the place. Now you've wasted your investment. So men want to make sure that they're pouring their investment into a cup that, that's going to contain that investment and is going to nurture that investment so that they get a return on it. So this is the catch-22 for girls. If, if they've been uh, uninvested by their fathers, they're literally outside of society. They're outside of the family. They're outside of the of society. They're in the wilderness. Well, and think well, about it from from a man's standpoint. So, if uh, men men generally have a honor, do like they feel an honor duty to other men that want to be more masculine to help them, and you'll see that quite often. That's why there's you know there there historically was so many men's organizations and very few women's organizations because men felt the need to help each other out. Um, but if you're a 20 year old woman and you need a man's help, how do you, 
you, you, you can't go and find a man that it's hard to find a man that doesn't want to sleep with you in exchange for that help. And right. they need it really to, cause they need father investment. They don't need a, they don't, they, it's, it's not about sex. And if they do find a husband to give that investment, that's, you know, that's very difficult for them to get to the point where they can attract the kind of man who's going to give them the investment and not just use them with the dangle in front of them, the potential for a husband. Without right. this, yeah, this, 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 this is the, the really, um, this is the evil plight of unfathered girls because of the nature of the sexes. Okay. Men are wired up to, to, I'm going to use the word sexually prey. Okay. But, but, but bear with me here. Men are wired up to, to sexually prey upon women who are not members of their family. Okay. Um, they want to gain sexual access to any woman who's essentially not a family member because that's how they reproduce. Okay. Um, so if a woman, if a girl has not been invested in by the men of her own family, she's extremely vulnerable to predation by men. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in addition to that, she's emotionally vulnerable too. If she hasn't been fathered, she has poor boundaries. Mm -hmm. both emotionally yeah. and sexually. So she's extremely vulnerable to predation. So what does she do? Well, she's kind of stuck. Um, she, she can go one way, which is, you know, she's got an open door policy to her, her heart and her body. And unfortunately, most men are going to use her. They're going to use her and throw her away. And that's going to damage her further. She's not going to get the investment she needs. She's not going to be impressed. And, uh, and she's going to be damaged further. The other way that she can go is she can choose to become her own father and she can father herself. She can enforce those boundaries, but now she's still not going to attract a husband because no guy is going to want to deal with that. Men will contend with another man to gain sexual access to a woman, but they will not contend with the masculine and a woman to gain access to that woman. This, this is really, really difficult for women. It's like, what does a fatherless girl do? I don't know. She almost needs a Christ-like man to come into her life who, who loves her enough from a place of compassion to give her the father investment that she needs to essentially adopt her into his family and provide her with that, but to not prey on her emotionally or sexually. And, and you know, we, we have a shortage of good men uh, in the world and we have a shortage, I think, of well-parented men and women. But what, what ends up happening is very often, even if a man has an interest in doing that and helping a woman, he doesn't have the skills to do it himself. You know, we, we often have broken men and broken women finding each other and trying to figure something out. And it is, uh, it's not a recipe for success. No, it's not. This is the one area where I have not been able to come up with a solution, you know, a remedy. Uh, there's a remedy for fatherless boys, which we just discussed, and, and I think it's working quite well. If boys can find their way to a mentor, they, they generally do fine. Fatherless girls, I, I, don't, I don't know how we fix that problem. Um, I mean, we would, we would essentially have to ask our, our most competent, our most masculine men uh, to, to sort of take these girls into their protection. Um, and in, in, in exchange for what, I don't know. I mean, what, what, where's the reciprocity there? What, what is that girl going to provide uh, to this, uh, this adoptive father uh, in exchange for that investment? I mean, that's something I suppose the two parties would have to work out, assuming a girl could even find such a man who'd be willing to do that for her. You know, I, I've had some uh, clients that I've, female clients that I've uh, mentored, and it is there. There is a there is a point where there has been too much um, too much lack of investment early on for there not to be a basis for the mentorship to take hold. They need really someone to just completely dedicate to them in order to get it done, and that that you can't do that with a mentor. A mentor is a little bit of guidance each week. It's not a hold your hand through the process thing. Right. Well, yeah. Women need a completely different level of investment than yeah. do boys. And um, I, I will say this. I mean, this maybe this is an incentive. It's kind of a, a negative incentive, but it's an incentive. This is another observation that I've made. Um, you know, we've got a lot of unfathered girls out there 
spanning many generations at this point, and they absolutely dominate the left. Okay, mm-hmm. the, the, the left basically is comprised mostly of unfathered girls of various ages. You know, that's, why they hate, that's why they hate men. They don't, they don't actually hate men. They hate the fact that they never got the attention they need from men. Cor- correct, correct. But here, here's, here's the incentive perhaps for men to adopt and father these girls. And as I said, it's a negative incentive, but bear with me. If these girls don't get fathered, I don't care if they're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of age, if they don't get fathered, they're going to burn your civilization to the ground. Mm-hmm. Okay. And guys, I, I, I know there's a lot of guys out there who think, oh, this is never going to happen. You know, we're going to band together. We're men. We're going to save the West. Have you ever seen what a plague of locusts can do? Have you ever seen what a colony of ants can do? And by the way, these are all feminine expressions in nature. The entire insect kingdom is feminine. It's, it's, it's a gynocracy. It's a matriarchy. Okay. Have you ever seen what they do just by sheer numbers? Oh, men, men will fight other men to the death. And then when they're faced with women, they go, uh, no, what am I going to do? I, I well, say all the time that the moment that Western women join Western men, most of the problems that we have will be fixed. You know, we have problems with um, uh, incompatible immigration, for example. It's sure. men almost completely vote against it. Women almost completely vote for it. Why are why are women voting to bring in? I'll tell you why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fight, you want fighting to men, fighting men into your country who hate your culture. Why are they doing it? You tell me. I know. I think we have the same idea. Oh, I, I know the answer. And, and this may be another challenge that European men have to, have to contend with. I've talked about this in other conversations. I believe that white European women, uh, the leftist women, the unfathered women, are inviting essentially these Arabs, these Muslims in en masse into Western civilizations because they see an opportunity to get investment. Mm -hmm. The reason they see opportunity to get investment is because Islam embraces polygamy. And that tells a woman, I've got an opportunity for marriage. Because under, under the Western model of compulsory monogamy, and again, women are hypergamous, so they always want the, the most alpha male that they can attract and secure. They have limited opportunity to get a superior male because of compulsory monogamy. They do not face that same challenge under polygamy. Mm-hmm. Well, and don't forget, a, a roughly a third of men pretty much have no interest in getting married. It's like, oh, I'd like to get married, but I don't want to do any of the work of it. Right, you right. Know? And, and which so, means they don't really want it. Um, right. and, and that means a third of women under monogamy have no mate. Right. And the other thing you have to understand, and this gets into, uh, you know, some of the things that Stefan Molyneux has talked about with respect to race and genes. We're, we're going to get into that area a little bit since you posed the question. Um, a white European woman knows that when it comes to selection, she has higher value to an Arab man than an Arab woman. She's, she will get a husband that way. She, she will get chosen. Yeah, we see a lot of people going, uh, white women going to Africa and finding a man there. And they get a man in his mid-20s who's fit and masculine. And these women are in their 40s. Correct. So th- this, this might be the incentive. Let, let, we'll just put it out there. And again, I, it's a negative incentive, but I, maybe guys need to think about this. If they're case selected and they're thinking about long term, they're thinking about what's going to become of their civilization. Yeah, if we're not you, saying marry these women. We're, we're not saying get into a romantic sexual relationship. No, we're actually saying no. the opposite. We're if, saying father them. Father, father them. Father, Father, Father them, them. In, in every in everything that that means that you know the setting of boundaries, the giving of good advice, the the love and concern that you have for them. It's that whole package. It's not it's it's not just the push. It's the pull as well. And this is you know this isn't something. It's this or or it's this or we're going to have to fight them. And I don't believe we're ever going to men in general are ever going to have. Western men will never be that violent to our own women. We're just never going to do it. Well, well, they, they, won't, they won't be that violent to their own women. And I also don't think that they can stand against the storm that's coming. That, that, that is Islam. Okay. I don't think they can stand against that unless they can 
make allies of their women. And the way to make mm -hmm. allies of their women is to offer the women something that they need. And, and these unfathered women desperately need father investment and a way to get into family. They, they cannot gain access to a husband unless they are seen as being worthy of investment uh, by a man. Um, and the only way they can get that is to be made whole by a father who's willing to, to mend the broken cup. So if you guys want to save your civilization, I think this is what you're going to have to do because otherwise they're going to ally with your enemies and you don't stand a chance mm -hmm. if that happens. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically they're being used as a shield, human shields uh, against mm -hmm. us. You know, it's, it, it is, we can talk about, well, that's not fair or um, whatnot, but fair doesn't enter into it when it comes to survival. Nothing's ever fair. No, nat natural law does, doesn't give a shit about fair. And understand that, that women, women are not wired the way men are. Okay, men, the, the, the father, the masculine civilization are one and the same. You, you know, men think in a very logical reasoning, you know, virtuous reciprocity and all of that. Women are products of the natural world. They, they are products of appetite and emotion. And they are the most, most uh, ruthless <laughs> animal you want to contend with. Men have fought. And yeah, women are going to do what they need to do to survive and to thrive. And yeah, they'll turn out their own men if they think that they can get a better deal elsewhere. No, no. Yeah, no, unfortunately, and, and as and I, a lot of men will hear that, and it will cause them to hate women. But you know that's ridiculous. Hating the natural way that people are is not going to help you to deal with reality. You have to accept reality the way it is. Well, it becomes well. This is about reproductive interest. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you've talked about this. Kurt Doolittle's talked about this. I mean, every every man and woman who's in the know on this subject understands. Men and women have different reproductive strategies because of just the way nature has designed us. A man's seed is cheap and plentiful. A woman's seed is rare and expensive, and so naturally, women are going to go for the best deal that they can get because they bear the greater burden of reproductive cost. You don't have to like it, guys, but if you want to live in this world and you want to have a stake in the future, I'm afraid you're going to have to accept it and find a way to work with it. Yeah, and the men who do find a way to work with it don't complain about it because it works out fine for them. Um, generally, whoever complains about a system are the people on the bottom of the deck. Right. And if you don't like being on the bottom of the deck, rise up get higher up on the deck or learn how to work the game better. So it doesn't matter where you are in the deck. You still are able to, to play, play a game that you enjoy that you want to win. Exactly. I yeah. think it's a great, great place to drop, uh, to, to end the conversation. Um, you know, there, there is, there are things that we can do specifically, you know, if we, if you're a, a young man and or even a, a middle-aged man and you are missing out on some of, you know, you're, you're on the spectrum of masculinity on one end or the other too far and you're seeking to balance yourself out again or you're looking for a mate that balances well with you, contact me, I can help you. Uh, and if you're a girl or a woman who has suffered through a lack of parental investment, through or sorry, uh, a lack of uh, father investment, uh, contact me as well. You know, the more people that I speak to, the closer we get to an ideal solution. And, and, and yeah, and, and I just want to, um, I want to trumpet what you're doing. Um, Noah does great work. I mean, Noah and I have had some conversations offline and I can tell you this guy's the real deal. He has great insights and he is able to, to tap in and really understand where a person's coming from, wh what they need, where their challenges are and speak to that. So um, yeah, what you're doing is great work, Noah. Thank you very much. No, I, I, I have a deep empathy and I really can, am concerned with people. I could do just about any job I want. I'm a very intelligent individual. I have a lot of skills. I've chosen to make helping people my life's work. And the reality is most of the people I'm helping, one of the very first questions I asked early on is, why don't you ask your father these questions that you've come to me with? And I noticed consistently, I can't. He doesn't understand. He couldn't answer these questions. He's in his own world. He doesn't exist. I can't speak to him because he's abusive, whatever it happens to be. 
Ne never once someone said to me, yeah, you know, that's a good idea. I should go ask my father. That's because they don't have a father. Exactly. There might, there might, there's a male there, a biological sire perhaps, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that there's donor. a father. <laughs> right. Doesn't mean there's a father there. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and the, you know, for, for men, I really do teach you how to become your own father, how to, to father yourself. Uh, girls can't do that. Women can't do that. Um, I have helped a lot of women to get to the point where they have a good man in their life who provides that for them. Uh, I've had a few clients get married in the last couple of years to really good men who've provided what they need. And it is, it is possible to have a solution. And the more people that I help, the more refined the solution gets, uh, especially for women and helping them to, to find a quick way. Uh, because with women, you know, the longer you wait to solve the problem, the harder it's going to be. Yes. With men, to some extent, they get a little maturity. It becomes a little easier to solve the problem. With women, it's the other way around. As time goes on, the damage gets worse. Uh, think of it as an infection. If you don't treat the infection early, eventually it poisons every part of your body. And for a lot of women, you know, they end up damaging themselves so much that it's very, very difficult for them to heal from that. And it is get, get help as soon as you can. And if you, if you don't want to get help from me, find someone to help you, uh, wherever that happens to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our, our women and our girls need more protection than, than boys do. It, it, it's always been that way. And we need to start, uh, it needs to be that way again. We, Ask we need to any start. father that has sons and daughters who needed more protection, always the girls. Yeah. And, and that is, it's not even a question for these fathers. And I mean, I would think that would be the best place to ask, you know, uh, uh, something like that. And, and for those of us who are fathers, invest in your children. If you are a father and you don't think you're up to the job of investing in your children, talk to me, you know, mm -hmm. that, that I can help you very quickly, straighten you out in a few sessions and you'll know what to do. A lot of times for men, it's a matter of lack of confidence. Uh, they are, they themselves were unparented or unfathered, and therefore it's hard for them to father their children. That's all fixable. But you need to get help because we, we want to stop passing this trauma on generation after generation. We want to fix this in a way that, you know, our, our future generations aren't going to have to go through it. And that requires us to put in the effort and it requires us to do it now. Yes. And, and this process can be interrupted at any stage of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you that I didn't start to really get effective intervention until my 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's made a huge difference. Um, so you can, you can get that intervention at any time in your life. You just have to be willing and able to do the work and, and get in touch with the right help. Get in touch with somebody like you, Noah, who can help provide that effective intervention. Thank you very much, Hathren. Um, I really You're appreciate you bringing this. You know, it, 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 there's a certain amount of emotional vulnerability in bringing your own story uh, for people to hear. And what you've come, you've put a lot of thought into this uh, subject, and you've really come upon something that I've seen through dealing with hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, the same pattern. And so it's interesting to see different people coming up with the same conclusion it definitely tells you there's something there that needs to be investigated further. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the next time we talk. Oh, my pleasure. And, and I hope that what I've shared with you today and with your audience is helpful. Um, the more people we can get the information out to, I, I think the better place we're going to be as a society. Thank you.